Okay, this is uh, week number six of uh, Bioengineering 599J seminar. And today uh, we have a presentation on, on the educational uh, and research opportunities in one of the five thrust areas in the department, which is uh, computational and integrative bioengineering. And uh, when I uh, became chair a little bit more than two years ago, I challenged this group. Uh, particularly uh, Professor Bassingswade and uh, Professor Foster to increase their the role in bioengineering education. In the last about two years or so, uh, Professor Bassingswade and Foster and others, uh, like uh, Professor Vicini and Dan Beard, Zhang Li and others responded really beautifully. Now, uh, computational bioengineering, I believe, is an integral component of bioengineering education and training. So t today, uh, three faculty members, uh, led by Professor Vicini, and then uh, Dan Beard, and then uh, Jim Bassingswade, will give us a presentation with a title of Opportunities in Computational and Integrative Bioengineering at the University of Washington. Paula. Okay. Thank you very much for this introduction and uh, completion of bioengineering actually has a long history in the department and uh, has a strong foundation and uh, I believe a bright future. This is particularly important with the changing nature of, the, of education in medical schools where the computer is really becoming a research tool just like the, the lab bench. And, um, it, and, and in addition, it does provide a framework in the department for the other thrust areas to interact positively. We believe that those interactions will increase substantially in, in the near future, and, uh, G, and G, Jim Bassingwaite and Dan Beard and myself here will hopefully show you, show you that with some practical examples, and we'll share with you some of these exciting new developments in the area. The problems that we actually work on do arise from two sources, and one is our own research in math and statistics, in computer science, and, and in software development. The other source is from our collaborators. We have collaborators that span a wide range of expertise of areas and problems. They come from biology and medicine, from pharmaceutics and toxicology, just to name a few. And the solution comes from teams that span all these areas. So the computational bioengineering, in a way, has to speak many languages and to act uh, as a bridge between these seemingly different disciplines. And it's truly a an integrative and multidisciplinary task. So who is the computational bioengineer? As I'm sure you all are wondering at this point, it's, uh, it's really a multifaceted sort of, of expertise. It, uh, he or she will know how to take apart a system in its own individual components. So it is a reductionist, but it also knows how to do the other, how to go the other way, to integrate the system from its small components up to the function. So it is really both, and it learns how to, how to recognize the behavior of the functional entity. It's a computational analyst, so we use and we design computational tools to facilitate and to bridge the gap between biology and quantitative sciences. It's a multimedia research and teaching environment. We initiate the new trends in information management, in strategies, and increasing the understanding of biology from a quantitative standpoint. And, and lastly, just because the discipline is bridging so many di different sources of expertise, uh, we can function as strategists and collaborators in research, both in academia and in the industry. So let's see how that actually actually takes place. And uh, as an example, we can talk about what happens actually I in this department, where we are aware of all that goes on in other trust areas that, that we interact with. And uh, just as an example, we, we can talk about uh, therapeutics and drug design and development, by being aware of, of what goes on in genomics and proteomics, in biology, research, in, in basic science, in biomaterials and nanotechnology, and in, the, and, and in D2H2, we know how to bring these expertise all together, and, and we can try how to integrate the discovery and the understanding, the modeling and the understanding of the variability of all these systems, and uh, with the final outcome being the right therapeutic at the right time for the right person. So just as, as an example of interaction, this is what, me, what will go on in, in this department um, always more as the, uh, in the near future. 
so who are we? You can learn more about the research core of this area from the departmental website, but just as a quick list uh, in alphabetical order, we have, uh, you will hear directly from Jim Bassinthwaite and from Dan Beer in the next few minutes. David Foster and I do direct uh, the research facility for population kinetics, which is a, a, a computational lab here at the U. Uh, Bob Friend uh, is the director of the Cell Systems Initiative, who strives to understand the dynamic control and flow of information in living systems from computational models and, uh, and new learning and teaching infrastructures. Zheng Li is the director of, uh, of NSR, the National Simulation Resource, which is best in place and is developing new software tools for analysis of complex systems. And Santosh Sakaraya is working on finite element models of the complex biomechanics of living tissue. So it's a very varied set of expertise that brings to the students and our colleagues uh, um, a set of tools that is very powerful and very um, and, and susceptible of generating new interaction and new knowledge. So the, the opportunities are both uh, within research and, and education. So um, we, the faculty in computational bioengineer, um, we have several collaborative research programs both with academia and w w with industry and, and that's very important because as we go and develop our e educational offerings we take advantage of our expertise that is in both areas and we try to respond to real needs that, uh, that exist both uh, in, at the university level and at the, at the industry level. We also develop and provide software and modeling tools and provide case studies for their application and so the distribution of the expertise becomes very wide and very, and very varied. And we promote uh, the system modeling principles that we operate uh, um, within uh, via educational offerings, both uh, at the university and outside. At the university in particular, we are struggling to develop uh, sequences with, within the program where at the end a, a student may have a, both the breadth and the depth they have to characterize engineering education. So at the start, all the students will take 485 computational bioengineering that uh, will uh, that do provide that, that does provide them with, with the basic tools to to, um, to to investigate biomedical problems with engineering knowledge and methodologies. Then if they have an interest in pharmacokinetics and uh, parameter estimation and complementary modeling, they can take this sequence where we have 540 by system identification and 584. A course about uh, uh, some advanced topics in computational and integrated biosystems. If they have an interest in biotransport, they will have to take 550, which is actually a requirement in our course that has several advanced topics in transport in biological membranes and systems. And then there's a, a, a more advanced course, which is on computer simulation in biology. If their interest is in, in molecular uh, bioengineering and nanotech, then after 457, they can take the this advanced course 575 in, in, in molecular modeling methods. The yellow courses are, are already being offered and uh, they are being de developed, while the white ones are, uh, will come online in, in the near future. But uh, it's important to realize that we're trying to, to provide several sequences where our students can find a, a roadmap to increase their expertise in, in a high number of, of areas. So let me talk a little bit about my research before I hand the mic over to Dan and Jim. Um, together with David Foster, I direct the Resource Facility for Population Kinetics, which is an integrated system modeling research resource funded by NIH. We do work with academia and industry on a continuum of integrated system modeling problems, and by, by doing that, we also develop new tools and, and theories to solve those problems, and we implement them to make these methods more easily available. We also promote the application of these tools through, through several collaborative service and, and educational ac activities. Just, just as an example, we do interact both with industry and basic science, but the questions that they ask are very, very different. In particular, when we do work uh, with industry, the, the questions are, are along the lines of how do we model the efficacy, the dosing and, and the response of some th therapeutic agent? How do we answer the question that relates to, to safety and toxicity? 
how do we lower the cost and we understand really how the disease and the therapy are working so that we, that, that we can design some better ones. When we, we interact with academic investigators, the questions are, are very different. They are mostly based on, on understanding. What is the structure? What is the function? How do they relate? Um, how do we model the, the, the system? And how do we design the experiment? And then how do we analyze the data? So there is a common ground, but, but also we shouldn't forget that the, that the needs here are very different. And when we plan our research um, undertakings and educational offerings, we have to keep this in mind and try to respond to both sets of needs. Just as an example, the key concept that we focused on is that of variability in, uh, in therapeutics. And uh, the link between the dose and the effect uh, has been a subject of investigation for a long, long time. But there is one step that's missing from this picture, and that step is that you have to find a link from the dose to the concentration in, in the bloodstream that takes the therapeutic agent around the body, and from the concentration to the drug effect. So this is usually done via Ma mathematical models of, uh, of some measurements that you may take during a clinical trial and this is what's called pharmacokinetics so the step that goes from here to here and pharmacodynamics so the step that goes from the concentration at the effect site to the actual effect now there is a lot of interest in measuring these things and to come up with better tools to understand um, how to model them and how to, uh, how to interact with them and in particular is because of the cost of drug development, which is mainly related to innovation and not really to old, uh, to old therapeutic agents. And the cost for new therapeutic agents is, is rising a lot, especially due to, the, to, to these issues, where I think that, that there are some engineering principles that can, that can play a, a, a really pivotal role. In particular, when we, de when we go about and design such an experiment, such a, a clinical trial experiment, we can make use of the knowledge that comes from modeling the disease process, from modeling the pharmacokinetics, and modeling the pharmacodynamics, so that we can really go from the dosing regimen, from a limited set of measurements of concentrations and effect levels, to actually design the, the trial process and, and really simulate in uh, target populations what the, what the disease progress is and, and, and what the effect of therapy may be. So it's a research activity that's uh, at, the, at the borderline between academia and the industry, and uh, I think it answers the needs of both, uh, and is very active lately, especially because of the increasing cost of some of these issues. So after briefly covering some ge generalities about computational bioengineering and my own research, I would like to, uh, to hand the microphone over to Dan Beard, who will talk to you about his research in uh, microfluidics and biofluids. Paolo. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, I'm going to spend uh, 10 or 15 minutes today going over some of the research topics that I'm interested in, computational bioengineering. Um, I'm, I, I, I focus on problems which range from sort of molecular level systems all the way up to uh, physiological level systems. Uh, and in addition, I've been spending some time thinking about um, transport in microfluidic devices and um, and how to how to aid uh, in the design and the analysis of uh, experiments in microfluidics. So one one research topic uh, is is this mass transport problem related to the delivery of solutes in vascular tissues and the uh, metabolism of those of those solutes in, in the tissues. So in, in order to simulate uh, transport in a structure like the one I'm showing on the right here, which is uh, vascular tissue from um, a tumor from rat brain, we need to develop new computational methods which allow us to treat these problems. What I'm showing here is, is a slice of the computational grid in the tissue domain. And this computational grid is relatively coarse. It's on the size scale of 10 micrometers. Well, 10 micrometers is much larger than the size scale of the vessels themselves. So when we, when we move to standard computational techniques like finite difference and finite element uh, routines, we find that these methods are not adequate. 
and we need to design new methods which allow us to resolve relatively complex geometries and relatively coarse grids. So, uh, in, in, as, a, as a computational bioengineer, it turns out that you have to become a mathematician as well as a biologist and a, um, bio, and, and a physicist and all of these other things that Paolo mentioned. Uh, what's an application of this kind of technique? Well, one application is, is studying the tr uh, transport of oxygen in bioenergetics and muscle tissue. And this is an example of sort of the packing of cardiac muscle fibers in uh, some sort of idealized hexagonal lattice. And in this three-dimensional view, I'm showing a three-dimensional network of capillaries. And on the right is the prediction of the oxygen tension profile in one of these muscle fibers here where this Z direction is the direction along the axis of the fiber, and the X direction is just a uh, cross section. Uh, so the muscle fiber has a diameter of about 30 micrometers. The oxygen concentration decays from the arterial end down to the venous end of the capillary, and we can see that the concentration is distributed in some smoothly varying gradient. Well, what's interesting about the oxygen transport problem is that the oxygen content is directly coupled to oxidative phosphorylation and the rest of um, bioenergetics. So we need to understand oxygen transport via the network and its coupling with hemodynamics of the vascular network and its coupling with oxidative phosphorylation and the rest of energetics metabolism in order to understand how transport is coupled with control of the network and control of flow in cardiac tissue. Another example of transport in computational bioengineering is microfluidics. And this here is a sketch of a device that uh, was designed by uh, Professor Folk, one of our faculty in the department, and it's intended to deliver at very specific concentrations various solutes to cells that are in, in culture. And this, this device is is uh, designed in order to take advantage of large arrays of, of microfluidic channels in order to do large-scale experiments on, and, and study the effects of very specific delivery of solutes on cell differentiation and cell behavior. Well, the, the mathematical concepts of transport are the same, whether you're talking about heart tissue or microfluidic devices. The only difference is the geometry, and we can we can apply our numerical modeling techniques to model the transport of microfluidic devices. So here I'm showing you, um, first of all, the results of a computational fluid dynamics simulation where the velocity profiles at the entrance to the channel are plotted as a surface here. So these squares are, um, represent the entrance to the fluid which is exiting out of this channel, and the color scale indicates the the predicted concentration profile where in this channel we have some solute, arbitrary um, inert solute being being evected and diffused and in, these, in the channels on the side there are zero concentration or no, no solute. So the, the, we, can, we can use our, our computational tools in transport to, to um, not only study physiological systems but to aid in the design and the analysis of uh, other experimental devices. And the final project I'm going to talk about is modeling large-scale biomolecular systems, and in particular I'm going to talk about chromatin. Chromatin is composed of um, an array of a large number of these so-called core particles. And this core particle consists of a large protein surrounded by DNA. Well, on the on the molecular scale, this is a very large system. But then again, chromatin itself is composed of a very large number of these very large systems. So in, in order to model this system, we need to take some sort of an integrative, uh, approximate approach. And in particular, this, this sort of integrated approach that I use, I, I construct a model for this core particle based on a United Atom Effective Electrostatic Parameterization, where the number of 
charges on this parameterized molecule is much smaller than the total number of atoms in the original system. So the analogy is if you were going to um, try to an analyze the mechanics of a skyscraper, you wouldn't want to try and model the stresses and strains on each individual rivet in the structure. You need to take some sort of an integrative mechanics approach. So then, based on building these, these large-scale integrated models, then I can build a model for the structure of the entire fiber and a model for the entire for the fiber looks something like this where these nucleosomes now here um, are packed together into some sort of repeating folded motif with diameter of about 30 nanometers so you might have heard the, the, the term 30 nanometer fiber as um, to, to describe the chromatin fiber because it has a diameter of about 30 nanometers and um, I just want to finish up very quickly by just asking the question, uh, what, what do all of these um, problems uh, have in common? So what, what does, what does um, you, know, you know, my studies of molecular systems have in common with studies of transport in, in, in large devices or... Um, large physiological systems. Of course, the word large is relative because we, these, these microfluidic devices are, are quite small. That's why they're called microfluidic. And capillaries are quite small too, but they're much smaller than, than molecules. And uh, the answer to that question, specifically the answer is not very much. They don't have much in common. Um, and searching for sort of a common thread or some sort of commonality between all these problems, the only thing I can come up with is fluids. And all these problems have fluids in common. Uh, biomolecules exist in solvent and in order to characterize the, 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 the dynamics of this large chromatin polymer we have to pay special attention to the dynamics of the fluid that, that surrounds the polymer and of course um, blood is a fluid whether or not it's in capillary or if it's in a micro micro channel so fluid dynamics is very important now fluid dynamics uh, you know, over over the past century, has probably been the prime motivator for a large part of applied mathematics. So I might be biased, and but I, I think I think that fluids are very important, and that's and and, and um, no matter what sort of biological system you're looking at. And if we answer this question in general, uh, then the answer is that we're applying computational tools to problems of biological interest, and also most importantly, we're having a lot of fun because we're studying lots of different kinds of problems. We're learning lots of uh, things about, um, you know, a very diverse uh, engineering program. So with that, Jim is going to finish up. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Paolo. Great, great start to a program, and uh, I hope I can continue it as well as you started it. But I, wa I need to talk to give you some idea about uh, the simulation resource facility, because in our group, it is a background a sustenance, if you will, for uh, computational modeling in the variety of applications that we have, which are applied to, to imaging, in, our, in, in PET imaging and NMR imaging, to uh, some ultrasound imaging, to pharmacokinetic systems and whole body modeling. Going, following Dan Beard, going from the molecule to the organism. Um, each of these things has its own facets, but the resource provides the background mathematical and computational support for the experimental research programs. They go together. The, the, uh, the sign that we have had up over our lab says, no simulation without experimentation. Let's take off on an old phrase that we all know in this country. But uh, the idea is that experimentation and analysis go hand in hand and serve each other in an important way. The objective then would be to try to, to uh, divine, define one's experimental procedures most efficiently by using the computational uh, representations of it. In 
a simulation resource such as uh, the one that David Foster and Paolo Piccini uh, head up and in ours that Zheng Li and I and, and Dan are involved in most explicitly we have a set of technology cores yeah, yeah. oh I know I'm hitting the wrong button <laughs> we have a set of technology cores which are uh, really technology simulation software functional imaging techniques visualization the optimization strategies for fitting models to data uh, finding the identifiability of, of those parameters which are thereby estimated. And here we're assisted by Claudio Cobelli, uh, uh, who is Paolo's uh, uh, advisor in his, for his PhD thesis in, in Italy. And uh, in other words, we work through a set of technologies to p apply a set of, of um, uh, strategies for analyzing real life data. The real life data involves a whole lot of biological topics in which we are usually immersed ourselves scientifically. A part of a resource is dissemination and training. Uh, all of our software is exported free. The new simulation software uh, that's Java based that Zheng Li is developing will, is being distributed free ac across the World Wide Web. And in addition, we give courses like uh, RFPK gives in the topics of our work. So we give courses in transport analysis uh, each year to visiting professors and whatnot, distribute the software. We have online web computation. You can go to our website and run models. You can download the system for uh, analyzing your own data and getting the parameter estimates. Along with this goes a training program. So we're trying to develop this, this particularly the web aspect of it, as a, a, a ever enlarging and, and deeper set of, of training programs that, so that can, people can use them uh, around the world. We're not nearly there yet, but it's beginning. And I think this, the principle that MIT has pushed forward, namely to put all the courses on the web for free, uh, this is, is an interesting way to go. Uh, I'm not sure how much we can afford to do it. It's very time consuming to put these efforts out on the website. Well, one of the things that we are developing in collaboration with people at University of Washington uh, at, at Cell Systems Initiative, Bob Francis Unit for one, and with people at Hopkins and Harvard and MIT and San Diego are cell systems. We're embarking on a program to examine in particular detail two cell types, endothelial cells and cardiomyocytes, in order to understand how they function as cells separately and then together. Um, so we'll start with really simple cells like red blood cells, but you know there's a lot of work been done on, on uh, E. coli already, and uh, uh, for, for example, a leader in it is uh, uh, Bernard Paulson at um, UC San Diego looking at metabolic systems, and I'll give you some hint about that. And yeast systems, the first eukaryocyte is not so different from us. We have a few more genes than the yeast though. Um, part of the modeling is handicapped by absence of data. And so an, a, a serious development is beginning on developing physiological, uh, pharmacological, uh, observational databases on things beyond the proteins. Of course, the protein databases are yet far from complete, but they are well developed and well structured. Databases at the higher levels of organization uh, required for looking at uh, biological systems are not well developed, but beginning. Um, we look on some of this development of cell systems as a vehicle for understanding pharm pharmacokinetics. Now, for example, uh, a young company, Ent Entelos, in California has developed uh, cell, well, uh, they're not even cell based. They take parts of cell systems and look at for example, in asthma, the cytokine systems, and have achieved a remarkable level of predictability of what intervention will do in these uh, integrative systems so that they can uh, now sell their programs on asthma and on HIV and on obesity 
for uh, currently just under two million dollars per program to Big Pharma. So there's a new industry growing up that relates to this kind of thing. Here's an idea of a cell system where we're just looking at a, uh, a cell that has channels for ions on its surface. So if, if it's a muscle cell, it'll have a storage place, sarcoplasmic reticulum, for calcium and the roots for excitation. But it has other things within it too. It has cal calcium binding proteins. Ah, it needs ATP. And so one needs generator systems for producing ATP, namely the whole of substrate, glucose and fatty acid utilization. And, and so uh, in terms of the glucose, Melissa Lambert working with Marty uh, Krishmerik is developing a model for glucose system. And we're developing models for the tricarboxylic acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation, which is needed directly to produce the ATP. So those systems will come together. Here's a little piece of an ATP system. And this is one tiny little corner of the Boringer Mannheim chart that you see up in the biochemical lab walls. Just a tiny piece of it. Well, as you start looking at the pathways in this particular chart, oh, you say, well, it's missing this and it's missing that. Some nice experiments by uh, uh, Bernard Paulson and, and uh, Savinelli uh, showed that when you took a simple network, here's, here's a, a network loop, for example, that goes through this set of compounds, and one can look on them as a really tiny loop and observe the fluxes through it. Well, in one such system, uh, um, Paulson was trying to see which genes affected the flux through that loop. So he did knockouts on E. coli. He knocked out one enzyme. The flux was unchanged. A second enzyme was knocked out. No change in the flux. The third enzyme reduced the flux. The point is that these maps are so incomplete that all the bypass pathways are not really on them yet and have to be worked out in some detail. So that when you're going from genetic engineering to try to produce product, whether it's in E. coli or in humans, you have to be concerned with all the side pathways. It's just like in a drug, when you give a drug, you're intervening with unknown results. You cannot predict the multiplicity of events that may follow the delivery of that drug. You may know its main effect or the one that you desire, but like giving thalidomide, it wasn't appreciated for almost years how devastating it was to embryonic growth. So these side effects occur with all drugs and it's a question of how serious they are, how predictable they are. So we're trying to put together better and better, that is to say, more complete, more detailed, more exact, more predictable systems from which to make explorations. What happens when you intervene? One can say, well, there's a kind of a moral imperative to think your very hardest to figure out what's going to happen when you intervene genetically or pharmaceutically. And given that incentive, there's a strong drive then to put together these systems as an aid to understanding of what you're doing. So that's, that's, that's part of it. So there's also the academic issue. You really want to understand systems. But the other drive is you must try to understand as best you can. So whether you're going from genome or working at the organelle and tissue and, and cell level with respect to the modeling, the ultimate goal is to link genome to organism in understanding of function. So these models will not, as, as Dan Beard put it so nicely, you don't uh, model the bolts in the building if you're looking at the Empire State Building's mechanics, but and you don't necessarily model even the individual genes if you're trying to understand blood pressure regulation at this level. So the models tend to be uh, cover only a hierarchical level or two, but not the whole way. And what's represented at the lower, more basic levels uh, causative levels in some cases, but remember, environment surrounds us. What, the, what emanates from the genome 
in turns into protein and protein expression is almost as influenced by environment as it is by genome. So don't ever forget this part of it. So the idea is to put it together. So it's hierarchical level by hierarchical le level without forgetting about what's underneath it. And if something changes underneath it, you then revise your upper level model in accord. One of these efforts that's coming to some fruition is trying to put together models of the, of the heart. This is a worldwide collaborative effort uh, centered really uh, here in New Zealand with Peter Hunter's group in, in the, in the uh, computational science group. Um, this uh, click here. No, no, that was the wrong one. Uh, how do I go back? How do I click here, Paul? Uh, hmm? Oops, I did it again. That one? The up button? No? How did you manage that? <laughs> He has a magic finger. That was the same button I pressed, I thought. <laughs> what this is, this is an integrative model of, of the myocardium, but you don't see the myocardium. It contains all of the finite element of analysis for a contracting syncytium of cells. What's observed in the blue are the cavities of the right ventricle and the left ventricle. The coronary arteries are put on there to give you an idea of where the shell, the myocardium, exists. And uh, then what you see with each beat is this twist as the heart contracts and shortens. This is, so this model is taken into account through some 3,000 finite elements, the fiber direction in each element of the heart. The lower panel shows shows the uh, electrophysiology uh, this time of a fibrillating heart and what you see are the waves of depolarization and repolarization proceeding through the myocardium that kind of uh, electrical modeling provides the basis for the contractile modeling what our job is to do is to put more of the metabolic considerations underneath it so that if you constrict a coronary artery and lower the ATP supply in a particular region. Now, how does that change the electrical spread and the mechanical uh, contraction? I'm sure it'll go. It's bound to go on. <laughs> and uh, so, in, a, in other words, these kinds of projects are are. Uh, uh, a vehicle for extending our understanding from from genes to organism, maybe to health. Um, the, the the clinical applications are through the imaging for the most part, as well as through the pharmaceutics. So structure is basic. We have to praise the problems. We try to get quantitative approach. It's all engineering methodology. Uh, we have to have a mechanistic system modeling. That is to say, there's a lot of structure in the databasing and the modeling technology itself. And uh, then finally leads to the dissemination of product, which is new insight into biological systems. Ah, I thought we were going to end up with the description of the courses. Uh, should we go back to that, Paolo? Or, well, so, that finishes our presentation, and we're open for discussion uh, from topic material, all three of us, uh, through to course design and planning.